Caribbean Newsline is brought to you by the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. Barbados' private sector to join trade unions in protest against tax tax measures. Our top story in Caribbean Newsline for Friday, July 21st. From the CMC News Center in Bridgetown, I'm Don Paris. Good evening. Barbadians have been called out to participate in a march next Monday as the trade union movement and the private sector turn up the pressure on government over increased taxes. At a press conference on Friday, the Barbados Workers' Union General Secretary Tony Moore and President of the Barbados Private Sector Association Charles Herbert said the joint action would not affect the main ports of entry or the state-run Queen Elizabeth Hospital. The unions have already called their members to take industrial action in protest of government's refusal to grant their demands for a reduction in the recently increased National Social Responsibility levy or to provide a coping subsidy for public sector workers and more spoke about how effective the action has been so far that the message of saints and placing the public is one that we will want to focus a lot more on and we from the feedback we have been getting from our various publics we think that there is now an understanding that urgency in dialogue is paramount and that is what we are really aiming for. Earlier in the week, the private sector had called on the unions to end the industrial action. This after they had previously hinted at joining the unions in their bid to force government to go back to the negotiating table. But now that the private sector has joined the unions, Herbert explains the impact Monday's planned march is expected to have on the private and public sectors. The objective on Monday is not to be disruptive. It is to show the level of support there is for our call. So the idea is to minimize disruption and to maximize the visibility of the support that the public has for our call. There will be some disruption. The private sector will be asking its members, where possible, to close their businesses and to make their employees available to participate should they wish to do so. Meantime, President of the National Union of Public Workers, Akani McDowell, says he's not about to apologize for the stance trade unions have taken in their current impasse with government. So far, a sick-out has affected operations at both major ports of entry, as well as the state-run transport board and the Caribbean Broadcasting Corporation. And McDowell accused Prime Minister Frondo Stewart of forcing the trade union's hand in the matter. And he says the unions should not be criticized for their actions. Responsibility cannot at this time be on us. It cannot be on the unions. The unions would have done everything that is possible to make sure that we had an amicable solution to this problem. The problem has to be, the problem now rests with the government. The responsibility now rests with the government. The government has to show that they are willing to lead this process and they have to come out. We have made our demands. They have to come out and tell us whether or not they are, well, they have to come out and make sure that they resolve this situation. 
And over in Venezuela, a nationwide strike against plans to rewrite the constitution shut down much of the capital on Thursday. Millions joined the 24-hour shutdown, staying at home, closing businesses, or manning roadblocks in a civil disobedience campaign that the opposition hopes will end nearly two decades of socialist rule. At least three people were killed in clashes between the police and protesters, and more than 200 others were reportedly arrested. President Nicolas Maduro said the strike was minimal and that its leaders would be arrested. Many private transportation groups heeded the strike call, while students, neighbors and activists hauled rubbish and furniture into streets to erect makeshift barriers. But in pro-government areas of the capital, life went on as usual with shops open and streets busy. Public employees also appear to have worked normally. Since April, when opposition protests intensified, almost 100 people have died across the country. Senior counsel in Trinidad and Tobago, Lawrence Ramesh Maharaj, is standing in defense of his co-counsel, John Jeremy, in the CL financial matter. This follows reports in the local media that Jeremy may face disciplinary action from the state. Jeremy, a former attorney general, had opposed the government's attempts to liquidate CLF following its collapse. But Maharaj says the threat of disciplinary action is an attack on the constitution and the rule of law. We get more in this report from Peter Christopher of CNews. One day after the government's application to have provisional liquidators appointed to preserve assets of CL Financial was dismissed in the High Court, there is a claim that one of the attorneys who opposed the application is now in their crosshairs. That attorney is former Attorney General John Jeremy. His co-counsel in the matter, Ramesh Lawrence Baraj, has come to his defense and described the action as an attack on the Constitution and the rule of law. According to a Trinidad Express report, Jeremy was said to be brought under the Legal Profession Act as he has a conflict of interest in the matter. An unnamed source told the Express that Mr. Jeremy as AG at the time of the Clico bailout in 2009, was privy to all the government information with respect to the intervention into CL Financial. And he also instructed as Attorney General that legal action be commenced against former CLF Chairman Lawrence Dupre on behalf of the state. Accordingly, this is a clear conflict of interest. In a release on Friday, Senior Counsel Maharaj said, I have carefully studied the conflict of interest principles. These principles are abundantly clear. They suggest that Mr. Jeremy has not only the right to represent his clients, but his clients have the constitutional right to representation of their choice. Mr. Jeremy is a critical element of the team. He added, the government has today mounted a desperate and cowardly attack on the integrity of a senior counsel hiding behind the title of an anonymous source. The Commission of Inquiry into an alleged plot to assassinate Guyana's President David Granger has begun. As we hear in this report from Travis Chase of HGP Nightly News, the man who said he was offered the job was the first to take the stand. First witness was called to the stand as the Commission of Inquiry into the alleged assassination plot against the President got underway. Andrew Gillard told the commission that after he made the report at CID Ifleri that his neighbor had offered him $7 million to take out the president, a high-ranking police officer telephoned CID Ifleri and instructed the ranks to release the businessman against whom the allegation was made. That call reportedly took place within minutes after the police had detained the alleged mastermind for questioning. Upon day talking about one thing in the car, now we're in a run in the corner and the corner and the wheel and the phone. And in a run on the phone. When the run on the phone, the run was talking to me for a period of time. And then he said, in a run. And when he said, in a run, Mr. C.R. is on the phone here. After that, the run was talking to me for a time. And I was on the phone talking. And after that, the man said, I got to tell you probably not a bit. So in a run, so I know it's free. Gillard told the commission that after that call to release the alleged perpetrators was received, the police in turn charged him for allegedly threatening the perpetrators, and to date he has not gotten back his bail money. 
the commission heard that the police dragged their feet on investigating properly the alleged assassination plot. Gillard also told the commission that he's living in fear, knowing fully well how dangerous and well-connected the alleged perpetrators are. He said he has lots of evidence to prove that there was a plot to take out the head of state. And coming up in Caribbean Newsline, police in St. Vincent and the Grenadines launch an internal investigation and we'll tell you why after the break. Join the Caribbean Broadcasting Union and its regional and international partners at the CBU Annual General Assembly, August 21st through 24th at the British Colonial Hilton Hotel in Nassau, the Bahamas, under the theme, Digital Developments in Caribbean Media. Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, Dr. the Honorable Hubert Alexander Minnis, will welcome delegates during the opening ceremony. Guyana's Minister of Public Telecommunications, the Honorable Kathy Hughes, will offer a keynote address on digital developments in the region. See the launch of the UNESCO-sponsored Manual of Social Media Guidelines for Caribbean Journalists with guest speaker, Jamaica's Director of Public Prosecutions, Paula Llewellyn. And hear from international media players about the new developments in digital television standards in Europe, the U.S., and Japan. And this year's Caribbean Broadcasting Awards Gala at the Atlantis Resort Paradise Island is not to be missed. Call 246-430-1007 to book your space in the three-day conference and exhibition. Don't miss the CBU 48th Assembly at the British Colonial Hilton Hotel in Nassau from August 21st through 24th. Discounts on flights to the Assembly on the official airline, Caribbean Airlines. In a place where legends start, the beach is just the beginning. So live a little for the exhilaration and the color of every moment. Where time is and life is a spirited event. Immerse yourself in the culture, the music, the people, the island. Love Antigua and Barbuda. Embrace an experience that leaves you breathless. From cricket to sailing week to carnival, and more. Antigua and Barbuda, the beach is just the beginning. Do you want a real Barbadian experience with peace and tranquility? A home away from home feeling? Come and stay at Best E Villas. We offer two amazing locations to choose from, Prospect St. James or Christ Church. Plan a staycation for your anniversary, birthdays, summer or winter breaks, or any special event. Best E Villas is located in close proximity to our lovely beaches. Call us now at 246-425-9751 or visit us at bestevillas.com and make your booking for the best in villas. Welcome back. Police in St. Vincent and the Grenadines have launched an internal investigation into voice notes in which men said to be members of the Police Welfare Association proposed that they storm the office of the Prime Minister. Commissioner of Police Reynold Hadaway tells CMC News lawmen have not ruled out the possibility of criminal charges against the officers allegedly involved. The recordings are said to have been circulated within a WhatsApp group comprised of members of the executive of the Police Welfare Association and are believed to have been leaked by a member of the group. In the three voice notes, the speaker discussed issues affecting police officers, including the implementation of a leave committee and whether police officers are insured when riding in police vehicles. But lawyer for the PWA, Israel Bruce, says the officer's comments were taken out of context. Jamaica's Senate has approved an anti-corruption bill that gives Cabinet the authority to decide whether or not certain government contracts should be investigated. Andrea Chisholm of TVJ News has the details. 
After years of discussions, Jamaica is now one step closer to establishing a single body, the Integrity Commission, to investigate and prosecute acts of corruption. But even though the bill made it through both Houses of Parliament, opposition senators are now registering their objection about one of the sections. Paragraph 50, subsection 2A and B of the printed bill essentially states that the Director of Investigations needs Cabinet's approval to investigate government contracts or license relating to defense or the supply of equipment to the security forces. No problem there for the opposition, but they disagreed with the Director of Investigations needing Cabinet's approval to investigate any government contract which the Cabinet may determine to keep private. For Mark Golding, it's way too broad. And it would facilitate a cabinet refusing to allow investigations of any type of contract that it feels it wants to maintain confidential. There's a potential for abuse in many matters and we have to trust that a cabinet of a country will, with the, the support of the uh, cabinet secretary, will manage this matter appropriately. But opposition senators were not convinced. They wanted the provision deleted. The government said no. We're not, um, we're not minded to change that policy position. It came from the Joint Select Committee. It was felt that the FID felt that there were some sensitive matters put before Cabinet, which it should have this enhanced level of scrutiny before it is agreed that they should be um, looked at by other persons, by persons other than Cabinet. If the issue for the government is the FID or any such agency, then we should so qualify this clause as we have done for the security forces. We did look back at the issue and we have discussed it and it has been agreed that based on the recommendation of FID, this would be kept as is. Yeah. Well, I don't accept that recommendation. I think, I, think, I think that that recommendation, if without being limited in the way that has been suggested, so that it would have to be on the written recommendation of the FID, if that is a concern. But you accepted it as chair of the Joint yeah, Select but Committee that's a and the whole circumstances Joint Select Committee have considered it. Circumstances in have changed. Everything government? has changed since this debushing situation and the role that Cabinet played in that and in interfering in the contracting process. So there was a divide. Opposition senators voted to delete the provision, but their government counterparts used their majority to keep it. So the proposal by Senator Golding does not carry. In the meantime, a new section was added to the Integrity Commission bill so that an executive director could be appointed to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the commission. In addition, Parliament will no longer be required to approve some of the commissioners. Four of them will be appointed by the Governor-General by instrument in writing after consultation with the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition. The law specifically includes the Auditor-General as the fifth Commissioner. The Integrity Commission Bill merges the Office of the Contractor-General, the Commission for the Prevention of Corruption and the Integrity Commission. Guyana's first global robotics team returned to a hero's welcome after being the highest placed team from the Caribbean. The inaugural first global challenge, which took place in Washington, D.C. earlier this week, brought together science, technology, engineering and mathematics students from 163 countries around the world. The challenge was to use robots built by the students to remove contaminants from a river. Guyana came out on top among the 17 Caribbean countries that participated. To much pomp and fanfare, this group of young Guyanese returned home Wednesday night after taking part in the first ever Global Robotics Challenge in Washington, D.C. on Monday and Tuesday. They finished 10th out of 165 countries. The youths were welcomed home by First Lady Mrs. Sandra Granger, Director of Sports Christopher Jones, and other officials. The emphasis being placed on robotics in Guyana originated only about one year ago when the STEM robotics camps were launched due to the interest shown by the First Lady, 
and overseas-based Guyanese Karen Abram. Guyana, although not technologically advanced, finished ahead of scientifically advanced countries such as Russia, China, and the United States. A statement from the Ministry of the Presidency on Thursday quoted the First Lady as saying that she is determined to ensure that every town, village, and community are targeted so that every child can become exposed to the possibilities of STEM education. She noted, too, that once facilities and opportunities are made available, more children will be drawn to these areas of study and this can only lead to further growth and development of the country. With the recent success, the First Lady disclosed that talks have begun with Ms. Abram to set up leagues and clubs in Guyana, which can promote and grow Guyana's interests and talents in robotics. That report from Royden James of HGP Nightly News. The other Caribbean countries placing fairly high in the rankings were Trinidad and Tobago at 16th, St. Kitts and Nevis 36th, Haiti 44th and Jamaica 48th. The next robotics challenge will take place in Mexico City in 2018. And ahead in Newsline Sport, Usain Bolt wins his final Diamond League outing. Stay with us. It's another episode When we out on the road This is what we love To celebrate, to celebrate This is not Hollywood No, we don't come out the road Drink, drink, drink King Baba And the kids In a place where legends start, the beach is just the beginning. So live a little for the exhilaration and the color of every moment. Where time is and life is a spirited event. Immerse yourself in the culture, the music, the people, the island. Love Antigua and Barbuda. Embrace an experience that leaves you breathless. From cricket to sailing week to carnival, and more. Antigua and Barbuda, the beach is just the beginning. We continue with sports. An eight-time Olympic champion Usain Bolt ran his first sub-10 second time of the year to win the 100 meters at the Diamond League in Monaco on Friday. The 30-year-old Jamaican clocked a season-best 9.95 seconds in his final Diamond League race to finish ahead of American Isaiah Young, who was second in 9.98 seconds. Here's a look at the race. Get away cleanly, Usain Bolt gets a poor start, CJ Uja right alongside him. Bing Chan Su going well right over here, and here comes Usain Bolt, or is he going to win it? Bolt's going to get it! Bolt wins it from Isaiah Young, and that is better. 9.95, not a good start from Bolt at all, but only he has the ability in the last 20 metres to ease away from the field. I and Bolt has confirmed he will run the 100 meter and the 4 by 100 meter relay at the World Championships in London next month, his final event before retiring. He says he hopes to remain involved in athletics even after retiring. A lot of direction I could go. Uh, one thing I know, I'll, I'll definitely be close with track and field. In track and field, my coach has said that I have to be his assistant until he decides to retire also. So I know I'll be racing with, I will be working the Racers Track Club very closely. But I haven't really picked anything or gone in any one direction at this point. 
Uh, Bolt will walk away from the sport as the most decorated sprinter ever. After dominating every Olympic Games and World Championships since shooting to international stardom in 2008 and after winning unprecedented double sprint titles at the 2008, 2012 and 2016 Olympiads and also having similar success at the Berlin, Moscow and Beijing World Championships, Bolt said it was time to call it quits. He said he'd done everything he possibly could in the sport. Jamaica's reggae boys booked a spot in the semi-finals of the CONCACAF Gold Cup after a 2-1 victory over Canada at the University of Phoenix Stadium in Arizona on Thursday evening. Goals in either half from Sean Francis and Romario Williams were enough to give the Caribbean powerhouses the edge and set up a final four meeting with tournament favorites Mexico in a rematch of the 2015 final. Francis sent the Jamaicans ahead in the sixth minute. The Jamaicans had a few opportunities to double their advantage and their lead was doubled when Williams curled a shot from the top of the box in the 50th minute. Captain and goalkeeper Andre Blake was forced into a number of tough saves but Jamaicans saw out the win. In a post-game interview, Blake admitted it wasn't an easy game. So all the guys came out, we stick together, we fight, and it's a great feeling that we're moving on. Now you started out well, you're up two to nothing, and then Canada came back and you had to make some key saves. What was the team thinking in the second half? Yeah, when we got the second goal, you know, we, we kind of had a break, you know, and I think we lapsed a little bit. They scored a beautiful goal and, and we, we dig deep, we figured it out, and, and we fight back and we, we, we won the game, so that's good for us. Now you've captained the team as far as the semifinals of the Gold Cup. What's in your mind going forward towards the semifinal? Yeah, it's been great. You know, I, I just have to keep doing what I'm doing for the team, whatever it takes, you know, and it's been a great run for us every game from here on in is the finals. So now we're into the semifinals. Hopefully we can go in again and get three more points. The Reggae Boys will now await the winner of the second game between Mexico and Honduras for Sunday's showdown inside the famed Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California. Blake says regardless of who they face, they won't take their opponents for granted. But it's, it's more about us than them. We're going to respect whoever comes, but it's going to be about us and, and going in and executing the game plan. And Jamaica's under-20 reggae girls get their CONCACAF Women's Championship quest underway Friday night when they tackle Curacao in a Caribbean Football Union Group B qualifying game at the National Sports Center in Bermuda. Interim head coach Xavier Gilbert has expressed confidence of victory, but he will not be leaving anything to chance against a team now battling for survival following Wednesday's loss. He believes the momentum and rhythm from his team's preparation phase since arriving in the country is a good indication that a positive result should be on the cards. Jamaica's 20-member squad, which comprises a majority of players who brought the country's the who brought the country Caribbean Football Union under 17 championship glory in Puerto Rico in 2015 are aspiring to surpass the feat of the previous under-20 team that made it to the CONCACAF championships in Honduras in 2015. They had bowed out at the group stage, finishing third on four points behind eventual runner-up Canada and the hosts. Only the three group stage winners are set to progress to the final qualifying stage and join St. Kitts and Nevis as the host of the final round. Haiti and the Dominican Republic are hosts of the other two groups. And that's the sports. We'll be right back. Caribbean Newsline is brought to you by the Barbados Tourism Marketing Inc. Grow your business or promote your event through the services offered by the Caribbean Media Corporation and Carib Vision. Our distribution provides a platform on cable, terrestrial television and websites. We cover carnivals and events from across the region. We can bring your event live and alive to the world. For music makers, program producers, businesses, we can expand your reach to in excess of 2 million households daily. Our other services include news updates to enhance your media products, studio space for program and development. We can facilitate the launch of new products and services and training. Contact us and we will help you unleash your creative ability, develop products and services and provide the medium to watch them grow. Contact Loretta Skeet at cmccaribbean.com or call her 1-246-467-1044 or 1-246-253-3889. 
Call and book your carnival or event today. In a place where legends start, the beach is just the beginning. So live a little for the exhilaration and the color of every moment where time is and life is a spirited event. Immerse yourself in the culture, the music, the people, the island. Love Antigua and Barbuda. Embrace an experience that leaves you breathless from cricket to sailing week to carnival and more. Antigua and Barbuda, the beach is just the beginning. A recap of the major developments of this day, trade unions and private sector officials in Barbados call on citizens to participate in a march against government's tax measures. And that's Caribbean Newsline. Thanks for joining us. Have yourselves a great weekend.